actions, the actions in themselves, uh, other than what may be the consequences of your actions. Um, virtue ethics, which focuses on moral character, uh, looking at a person in, its, in himself and uh, seeing how um, that may um, make up for their uh, consequences. And uh, consequentialism, which looks at the consequences in themselves. Uh, applied ethics. Applied ethics refers to the practical application of ethics uh, in respect to real world, real, real world problems. Uh, applied to the professions of healthcare, law, business, etc. Uh, questions and the choices that follow are inevitable. We want answers. Decisions uh, need to be made. So, um, and ethics provides us with a framework for the actions we take. Uh, applied ethics. So examples of applied ethics. Uh, healthcare ethics, um, as was covered by Gary Goldsand in the course. Uh, Legal ethics, uh, corporate ethics, and technology ethics. So ethics is everywhere. Um, the concept of the good life. Uh, so what is the good life in philosophical terms? Uh, the good life is regarded to the uh, to the kind of life an individual may dream of living. So um, I don't know, wealth and uh, success and in that regards. Uh, at one point in time, the good life was simple. Uh, this is not so much the case today. Um, today we're a lot more, I guess you could say, materialistic in the way we look at things. Uh, and uh, so, just quickly, Aristotle's Nicoma uh, in Aristotle, in Aristotle's uh, Nicomachean Ethics, um, he explains that uh, the good life is based off of living a modern life. So, uh, I'll get more into that later on. Uh, now, in regards to the good life, uh, we usually uh, correlate the good life with happiness. Uh, so, how do we measure happiness? So, I was uh, kind of wondering that myself too, and then I uh, went up and picked up this book, it's called The Little Book of uh, Luca, and uh, it's uh, written by the CEO of the, um, it's, a, it's a happiness research institute, so, and that's based out of uh, Denmark, and uh, so I read that book before I did this presentation, it uh, provides quite a bit of insight, which I'll apply here. Um, for decades, and more recently, happiness has been summed up like this. Imagine two friends meeting after a long time. How are you? The one friend asks the other. And uh, their friend replies, I make $80,000 a year. Um, this is how we have been measuring well-being traditionally. Uh, money equaling happiness. Uh, income as a proxy for happiness, general well-being, and quality of life. Uh, however, income is objective and happiness is subjective. And I'll get into that right now. Uh, so what is meant by subjective? Um, what really matters is what, how you feel about your life, um, this is what really counts. You are the best judge of whether you are happy or not. Uh, according to the Happiness Research Institute, um, how you feel is the new metric of happiness. That's pretty great. Uh, if you are happier than your neighbor, uh, who has the bigger house, the fancy car, and the perfect spouse, you are the one that is doing something great. Uh, the dimensions of happiness. Uh, so distinguishing between uh, being happy right now and being happy overall, respectively known as the effective and cognitive dimensions of happiness. Affective or hedonic dimension examines everyday emotions, um, so how you might feel in the moment right now. Uh, cognitive dimension refers to the overall satisfaction of one's life, so taking a step back and self-reflecting on your life. Um, the dimensions of happiness, of course, the affective and cognitive dimensions are connected, and they do overlap to an extent. If your days are filled with positive emotions, you are more likely to report high levels of overall life satisfaction. Uh, equally, however, life is usually a little like this, and this, this sums life up pretty well. Sometimes maybe good, sometimes maybe shit. <laughs> That's a pretty great job at summing up everyday life. Um, sometimes <laughs> maybe good, sometimes maybe shit. Okay, um, the last dimension of happiness, uh, to make things a little more complicated, let me introduce a third dimension called eudaimonia, the ancient Greek word for happiness, and is based off of Aristotle's uh, perception of happiness. According to Aristotle, the life, the good life was a meaningful and purposeful life, so going back to that concept of virtue. Um, some quick happiness statistics. Um, so, as you can see here, uh, the uh, 2018 study by the World Happiness uh, Institute. Um, they rank countries off of happiness and things like that. Uh, and uh, the, hap the happiest countries came out to be those in the Nordic part of the world. So Finland, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, Switzerland, Netherlands. Canada sits at 7th, New Zealand at 8th, Sweden and Australia. Um, so why is this? Uh, happiness in accordance to well-being. 
uh, togetherness. So um, from this uh, book that I read, it stated that um, communities uh, led to um, uh, more well-being within a country. Uh, Tax rates, almost 9 out of 10 people living in Denmark say they happily pay their taxes, according to a Gallup survey taken in 2014. Mindset of not paying taxes, but instead purchasing quality of life, uh, investing in our community as book um, Happiness in accordance to well-being, income. There is a correlation between income and happiness. Uh, one money means that we can put food on our table, put a roof over our heads, and support our children. Money has the power to transform misery into happiness. But when money is spent, when you have run out of stuff you can buy, that will improve your happiness. You have peaked and is meaningless. So buying your dog a, a cloud that he can float on or something like that <laughs> is, means nothing. Um, and this is also can be referred to the economic uh, law of diminishing marginal utility. So the more, more times you consume something, the less meaningful it really is. Um, what else contributes to well-being? Help. It's a good help. Um, freedom, choices, and work-life balance. Uh, the, the ability to trust those around you, and uh, kindness. Uh, how does all of this tie in with ethics? Um, virtuous behavior contributes to, to moral excellence, and as a result can, can contribute to a happy life. Finding a balance between two vices, so that is what virtue is, uh, finding a balance between two vices. According to Aristotle, obtaining virtue is to behave in the right manner as a mean between extremes. Examples, healthcare, freedom, trust, kindness, other factors that contribute to well-being. Now into burnout. Uh, this is Peter Brinley, so um, I attended a, a, a lecture. It was a lecture. Medical Grand, uh, medical grand Office, yes, <laughs> with uh, Dr. Solis. And uh, yeah, Peter Brinley gave uh, a quick uh, presentation on uh, burnout in, uh, the, phys in the healthcare setting. Um, he's a professor in critical care and ethics and has an in-depth focus regarding burnout, specifically in healthcare. So what is burnout? Well, according to critical care physician Peter Brinley, in his burnout article, and I quote, burnout is commonly understood as an emotional condition encompassing mental fatigue, physical fatigue, frust frustration, and disengagement. So I'm um, pretty sure around this time, exams coming, so all oh, uh, that. Uh, in Peter Brinley's article, it is also stated that uh, burn burnout typically results when dedication fails to produce hope for results, and is more likely when goals are unrealistic. So again, you'd be studying for an exam or something, and then you end up failing the exam. Uh, according to his SMACC video, uh, Peter Brinley's good life consists of letting go of wealth, arrogance, etc., and instead displaying gratitude. So again, once again, letting go of maybe materialistic concepts and focusing more on virtue. Um, so the general scope, according to a 2018 uh, Gallup study uh, of nearly 7,500 full-time employees, found that 23% reported feeling burned out at work very often or always, while an additional 44% reported feeling burned out sometimes. Job burnout accounts for an estimated $125 billion to $190 billion in health care spending each year and has been attributed to type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, GI issues, high cholesterol, and even death for those under the age of 45. So we're basically being worked to death. Um, the general scope, factors, unfair treatment at work, unreasonable deadlines, unmanageable workload, lack of support for managers, working while not at work, so taking emails outside of work, texts, etc. Uh, and one more, just here, burnout is everywhere, so as you can see, um, most of the fields that contribute to hospitality, such as food services, manufacturing, medical health care, education, um, came out on top, but um, there, as you can see, there, burnout is everywhere. The medical scope, quite recently there has been a lot of research going into physician-based burnout. According to the Canadian Medical Association, one in four Canadian physicians report, bur report burnout. A 2018 NCBI article has reported that one in two physicians are burned out in the United States. As a result, depression and suicidal thoughts are on the rise and reported as well. Uh, so just take a quick look at physicians. Um, according to a 2018 Medscape study done in the United States, primary care physicians earn an average of $223,000, while specialists earn an average of $329,000. So in the top percentage of income earners. Uh, an average uh, plastic surgery came out on top with $501,000, uh, orthopedic surgery averaging at $497,000, and cardiology averaging at $423,000. 
Physicians worldwide averaging around $270,000, with Canadian physicians on top averaging $324,000 a year. So, uh, however, even with the extravagant income, a little over than 50% of physicians are unhappy outside of work, let alone at work. Um, the numbers at work are a lot higher. Uh, those averaging the highest income are actually reported as less happy than the latter, those averaging lower, uh, than those averaging lower incomes. Uh, this has been correlated to less happy marriages, obesity rates have spiked, and depression and suicide. Uh, so what's the deal? On average, physicians have reported prioritizing the healthcare and well-being of those in their care far beyond their own because they feel that they have to. Uh, increasing expectations. Physicians now, according to Peter Brindley's uh, article, there are now over 13,000 listed diseases and syndromes, over 6,000 drugs, and over 4,000 procedures. So lots, and uh, lots of competition as well. Also brought up is the myth of invincibility. Um, so that in that case, it's uh, my patients get sick, I never get sick sort of uh, motto. Uh, never say no. Physicians don't really back down. Uh, and once again, are really competitive. The better we do, the better we are expected to do, correlating to more work. Um, so this came out really terrible. But um, uh, just here, looking at this study, uh, so using family practice as a, an origin base, uh, the specialties that are a lot higher burned out came out to those really high um, surgical intensive specialties. So vascular surgery, critical care, neurosurgery, thoracic surgery, um, otolaryngology, and that sort of stuff. And then from here you can see that uh, these ones on the bottom, which uh, average low burnout, are also a lot more satisfied with life, of course. And then these ones are top, on top are a lot less satisfied. So, uh, how can we fight back? How can we fight burnout? According to Peter Brindley's uh, article, burnout says as much about the employer as the employee. Burnout can become contagious if ignored. So, I'm burned out, you're burned out, we all become burned out, as the saying goes. Um, if I go down, you're coming with me. Um, confidential counseling, uh, social support in that sense of togetherness that we that was uh, spoke about before, um, being a community, and that sort of stuff. Uh, evaluating ourselves, so taking a step back and seeing how our life and our happiness is, is going. Uh, deliberate goals. Changing careers, maybe. Uh, maybe medicine is not suited for everybody. And, uh, pursuing meaning, gratitude, and virtue, again. Uh, how ethics ties in? Looking to virtue. So, uh, once again, that um, idea of uh, Aristotle's idea of um, taking a step back, uh, assessing yourself, living an examined life, uh, abandoning, abandoning materialism, um, so letting go of uh, wealth and that sort of stuff, uh, using principles and tools and the tools offered by ethics to take a step back and live in and examine life, emphasis, emphasized as a life that is worth living. Um, that was said by Socrates in uh, Plato's Apology. Uh, going back to the idea of ethics as a framework for the actions we take. So how about, what, what can we expect for the future? So uh, in regards to the future and the approaching singularity, where, where will this fit in? Uh, will we still need ethics? Uh, will the questions we have, and more importantly, the choices we make as a result, even matter? Um, will we as humans then be the most capable of handling our own fate and morality? And with the rise of the singularity, will technology have all the answers to our questions? As a result then, will the human race be necessary at all? We might then be able to live our lives untethered to the world around us and focus on living the most hedonistic lives possible. So caring what well, technology answers all of our questions, uh, predisposing questions, uh, we live a pretty comfortable life uh, uh, and seem as possible. And that's my references and uh, any questions and decisions here is thanks. <laughs> any questions? Um, so do you believe, and I guess to other physicians in the room as well, um, that physicians should be held to like a double standard as you kind of presented there? Yeah, a double standard doesn't mean what we uh, so, like, um, you mentioned that physicians believe themselves that they they need to um, put themselves above oh, really? their uh, patients um, and always, like, you know, always being someone who is there for their patients and that they themselves have this myth of invincibility, like you mentioned. 
And I guess it's open to Dr. Solis and everyone else here as well, since you guys are actually physicians. Well, what would you say, Dr. Solis? I want to hear your opinion. Yeah, well, I think that uh, being humble and honest it is highly effective in, in uh, talking to patients. I mean, if you think of your own doctor and the conversation that he or she has had with you, a lot of it is is influenced by the fact that they have so many patients to see, right? It's a <laughs> like, like communicate a lot, but sometimes you end up in a situation where the physician has time to talk with you, and then hopefully what will come out is the physician's humanness, the way in which you and he or she share qualities, he can empathize, and he's also interested in like what's going on with you in general, you know, you came to see me about a specific problem, but how are things going in general, you know, are there any big overarching problems we haven't talked about? And that question's easier for the patient to answer if the doctor indicates that he has also encountered some big overarching questions. It's not just that you're weak and flawed and that's why you might have such a thing, but that it's sort of the human, human condition. We're all kind of like that. We're all vulnerable, you know, every life is sort of a work in progress and nobody has all the answers. So I think that it's a much more effective way to communicate than a kind of top-down, you know, I, I, I am a superior being to you, I'm deigning to talk to you for seven and a half minutes, but you know, listen carefully because I got a lot of important stuff to do and you don't, you know. I mean, that, that, that really can make the patient sicker if it encounters with the doctor reinforces the idea that they don't have agency, they can't really change anything in their lives, they're absolutely powerless, you know, the world is this malignant place um, plotting against them and they have no, you know, defenses. If, if, if that's the way you feel, then you've actually been harmed by going to see the doctor. On the other hand, the doctor can get you to feel more empowered and uplifted and like you're um, on top of things in your own life, uh, then he or she has succeeded in helping your well-being way beyond just the specific problem that you came up with. Yeah, I don't know. That's just my problem. Yeah, Caleb, uh, like, I didn't cover it in my uh, presentation. Um, but like the concept of autonomy that we covered in the course, um, uh, patient autonomy and uh, their their self-governing choices and things like that. So I think that uh, maybe a physician can say something, but at the end of the day, it's up to the patient. Um, you know what what a physician might uh, contribute to uh, a patient's life maybe doesn't matter, and it's at the end of the day, it just matters what the patient's morals and the values are. So um, yeah, any other questions? Hi. Um, do you think existing technology, like today's day and age, has made physician well-being better or worse? Physician well-being? Yeah, like, like the different stress that you talk about, like the levels of unhappiness. Do you think technology has kind of I increased think, that instant demand, or has it um, alleviated some of that stress? Well, I think going into the hospital and shadowing Dr. Solis and just getting a look at, into that, but you see a lot of people carrying around uh, iPads and uh, phones and all, their, uh, all that technology. I definitely think that it has improved some like uh, the, the quality aspect of uh, their job, but uh, I think we still have a long way to go uh, in terms of uh, burnout. So it's worth talking about Connect Care. Connect Care is the name for the new uh, Epic uh, and Beaker-based uh, uh, clinical uh, information system that we're just starting to sort of work into as an entire province. So it, it, it's a really big deal and it should mean that all the things were broken in the past like 
that in our work life we were using much more primitive and unsatisfying uh, communication means than we were in our personal lives. You know, none of us were leaving voicemail for our friends, but we were leaving a lot of voicemail for colleagues because that was like the only way to reach them, you know, and stuff. And, and, and uh, really old fashioned communication and, and, and many basic um, problems communicating, just figuring out who is this patient's doctor. Who is in charge of the clinical care of this patient now? The patient has a, you know, a, a pathologic specimen, a, a, a biopsy of some organ. Who is the person looking at that? Seems like a simple question. Who is the doctor? Who is looking after the patient? And who is looking after the biopsy? But in the present system, it's quite hard to answer that. Well, you get the impression almost nobody knows. So you say, well, it must be one of these five or six physicians. And the other side is also assuming that. So everybody, yeah. So it, it's, it's surprising how clunky it is now. But I think it could improve very quickly. Having said that, the laboratory part of this new thing, it's called beaker, and I'm going to be a beaker super user, so I get trained before other people and then I sort of teach them. So anyway, if it doesn't work out, it'll be my fault. <laughs> so, I guess. So, anyway, that's the answer there. So I think technology gone wrong can be a cause of burnout, but technology properly used can be the solution. Anyone else? No? Yes. I can get Okay, so I just had a quick question about these burnout stats you presented, right? Mm -hmm. So so if you have a bunch of physicians, a bunch of doctors working in the hospital all the time, these long shifts, long hours, right? Wouldn't it just make like from a quali quantitative sense to just train more doctors to work shorter shifts? But you have to look at like the supply of doctors, how many doctors you have, um, and things like that too. Um, I, I, have, I have seen studies, let me go back here. Yeah, um, so I, I did end up reading, there was another study done by Medscape that um, say when you look at, um, uh, there's a lot more burnout in a lot of more surgical intensive um, specialties, so like vascular surgery, uh, thoracic surgery, neurosurgery, and a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot less people are going into those specialties because they're not considered cushy specialties. Um, so what they consider a closer specialty is maybe like radiology or um, pathology, Dr. Solon, sorry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Rear, cushy, yay. Uh, dermatology, ophthalmology, um, a lot of the more um, procedure, I guess you could say less procedure intensive uh, fields. Uh, and I, again, a lot of that has to do with um, well, that, those materialistic views. So um, people want, uh, those fields there, uh, but they're less stressful, for sure. Um, doctors, how did you consider pathology less stressful compared to maybe your peers in, I mean, if you have any peers in neurosurgery or thoracic surgery? I think may, maybe we're all considering this a bit too simply. Your happiness with your life is not directly determined by how many hours in the day you are working. Mm -hmm. Because the most pleasurable thing in your life, if you're lucky, uh, many days, many times, turns out to be your work. You know, it's just an incredible amount of fun, and you can't believe that people would pay you to do something that's so much fun. You know, so that that is a possibility for every single one of you. You know, it's not just in medicine or many other very satisfying careers where kind of you don't need praise, you don't need constant rewarding because you, they, there are intrinsic things in the job where you already know that you're helping people and doing good. It's, it's just obvious, you know, race ipsa loquitur, the, the, the thing speaks for itself. 
you don't have to wait for people to come by and tell you, hey, you know, you did pretty well. But when you see the smiles on people's faces that you're interacting with and, and that they walk taller leaving the office than when they came in kind of thing, you know. So um, it, it isn't that um, the, the whole solution is to assume that everybody is relatively unhappy at work and so if you can lessen the number of hours and have more people doing it, that, that, that no, I mean, I mean, that's absolutely not the way we're, we're headed at all. It, if you think of like a, a final uh, endpoint where almost no one you know has a job, not only do you not have a job, you don't even know anybody who ha has a job, and yet you're all happy and satisfied, and what you're spending time on during the day is, is like ideal, and, and, and you feel very happy about it when you meet somebody else. You immediately enjoy telling them that, you know, I spend 100% of my time in virtual reality, and oh, it's so wonderful, you know, and yeah, so, so it's, it, um, there were primitive times in, in the past where it was true that everybody hated work because the work was very arduous. Uh, I don't know, you can think of Nelson uh, Mandela chipping stone in the, in, in the sun of South, South Africa, right? He was in you know, prison for decades, right? And, and, and so yeah, that was, that was tough. And uh, they wouldn't they even let him have long pants, so he was in, in, in like sort of shorts all, all, all this time. Um, so there are historical situations where it's okay if you're watching the clock and just dreaming for the workday to be over because everybody else feels the same way and that's, that's just the way life is. But that isn't the situation that we're in today. You know, a lot of people have very satisfying work. And, and I think we're sort of headed toward an, an interim period where almost everybody has very satisfying work that they like. And finally, it becomes clearer what they really like and what makes them ha happy and less clear that they still need to do work. So ultimately the work disappears and we just sort of, you know, support everybody without them working. So you have to kind of factor those things in and not just assume that we live still in a Charles Dickens world, you know, and, and stuff like that. We really have to worry about the pickpockets and, and, and stuff like that. There are problems today, but they're different and it's kind of an evolving situation and one of the advantages of taking this course I think is to make you more equipped to actually shape how the future happens. I hope that answers your uh, question a lot better than I could uh, make it. <laughs> uh, thanks Dr. Solis. Uh -huh. um, any other questions? Oh well okay thanks guys thanks for listening. Okay, so 